Thank you for watching Palestine Studies TV. I'm your host, Clea Twin. In today's episode, I'll be talking to Nadia Hijab, a senior IPS fellow, about the question of international aid to Palestine. Nadia, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. Uh, since 1993, the Palestinian people have received approximately $15 billion uh, in international aid. What has that aid achieved? Well, you know, in the first couple of years after the first Oslo Accord was signed in 1993, you could argue that aid had uh, achieved quite a bit. I mean, that it was being put to a useful purpose. Uh, many Palestinian exiles came home uh, to the occupied territories. Um, they joined hands with the Palestinians living there to build institutions, and many institutions were built very effectively. And you have experts like George Nathan of uh, Georgetown University, who in fact argues that nothing has really been added to the institution building efforts of those days. So at that time, aid made sense when it looked like you might have a Palestinian state. However, it soon became clear what a disaster uh, the, Os the, the Oslo Accords were, and accord after accord was signed, and all that, and not never implemented by the Israelis, and all that happened was uh, colonization, and really foreign aid uh, stopped making uh, sense at that point, and in fact began to have um, very early on uh, quite a harmful effect. And you could argue that perhaps since 1994, when the Paris Protocol was signed, and it's one of the most pernicious of the Oslo Accords, really. So after that point, um, foreign aid was effectively subsidizing Israel's occupation of the Palestinians, relieving Israel from its uh, obligations under the Geneva Convention to take care of the Palestinian uh, welfare, and also subsidizing uh, Palestinian collaboration with Israeli or PA collaboration, Palestinian Authority collaboration with Israeli security forces. Um, and we're now in the disastrous situation we are today. The PA right now is experiencing quite a severe budget crisis and it's largely due to decreased foreign aid flows. Uh, so how ex exactly how dependent is the Palestinian Authority and by extension the Palestinian people on foreign aid? It's extremely dependent. I mean, the whole uh, uh, Palestinian economy um, has been become dependent. Uh, donors uh, pay for a number of things. Uh, um, the direction of the Palestinian economy is, is, is dependent on aid. And about a million uh, Palestinians depend on the 100,000 uh, plus, 120,000 or so uh, Palestinian civil servants who work for the Palestinian Authority. Um, and, you know, salaries are paid out of aid. So the economy is actually extremely dependent on foreign aid. It's a very bad situation to be in. And in the past few days, we've seen protests across the West Bank uh, exactly over the economic situation. What would happen if aid continued to decrease or even stopped altogether? Well, you know, it would be a very difficult uh, situation indeed. Um, um, there are rising prices, as you say, there's protests against that, but there's also protests by Palestinians, uh, a, a movement now calling itself Palestinians for Dignity, um, which is uh, calling for uh, the elimination of the uh, Paris pr Protocol. And they've just done a flyer calling for demonstrations for that purpose, and they point out everything that's 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 wrong and that's made Palestinian um, uh, the Palestinian economy uh, totally subservient to Israel and to totally dependent on foreign aid. But wouldn't it also uh, leave many Palestinians without any kind of support? Yes, I don't think aid uh, can be cut off um, uh, as suddenly as all that. No, I mean. Uh, Palestinians need it now to survive because of the way the economy has been skewed. Um, however, uh, unless, until and unless, I mean, and that's what the, the movement uh, Palestinians for Dignity is asking for, and many Palestinians both uh, under occupation and in exile believe is so crucial that there needs to be a political, a clear political program for Palestinian self-determination, um, freedom, and rights. And unless you have such a political program, uh, you know, aid is only going to uh, help uh, 
Israel's occupation. It's not going to help the Palestinians. And more than anything else, actually what the Palestinians need, along with the capacity to survive, um, so they do need aid, they do need support. And, and frankly, they are entitled to support by the international community because it's the international community that have enabled Israel to establish itself and to continue to colonize the Palestinians and to deny their right. But in the meantime, you know, there, there is a need for a political program that sets this whole movement for self-determination back on track. People need to be very aware of how Israel controls them and their economy and of the role of foreign aid. Before we talk a bit more about what that program might be, uh, I wanted you to talk a little bit more about the ways in which foreign aid sustains, helps sustain the occupation. Well, I mean, the most glaring example is that uh, much of U.S. aid and uh, British aid as well goes to training the security forces and for the collaboration uh, of those security forces with the Israelis. So effectively, the aid is paying for the Palestinians to be their own policemen, to police their own occupation um, to the benefit of Israel. And, uh, you know, those security forces have in recent weeks cracked down on peaceful Palestinian protests. Also, during, for example, the Israeli uh, attack on an invasion of Gaza in uh, December 2008, um, January 2009, the um, uh, Palestinian security forces prevented Palestinian demonstrations in support of Palestinians in Gaza. So that's one so-called benefit of aid. And um, another so-called benefit of aid is that the donors um, have a lot to say about the direction of the Palestinian economy and the projects that are selected. For example, um, less than, I believe, 1% of the Palestinian budget goes to agriculture, which should be a mainstay of the Palestinian economy and, and certainly would be one way for the Palestinians um, to, to establish their self-reliance and begin to disengage somewhat from the Israeli economy. And then another aspect of why aid is really problematic is that civil society, which, you know, spearheaded uh, the Palestinian civil resistance during the first intifada against the Israeli occupation, has been, I don't want to say corrupted or co-opted, but also has become aid dependent. And a lot of, uh, in what is called the NGOization of, of Palestinian civil society, a lot of Palestinian NGOs um, non-governmental organizations, you know, organize their agenda around um, what donors want rather than what the Palestinian people who really have not completed the struggle for freedom need. But is it even possible for donor agencies like UN agencies or even international organizations to provide politically neutral aid given the political environment that they operate in? Well, I mean, I think more than politically neutral aid, you need, I mean, obviously Israel controls even the donor community such that um, uh, uh, it uh, prevents projects that it sees are against its interests, and it's even destroyed donor projects in Area C, and there have been some mild protests from um, the European Union uh, countries. Um, but what is needed more than politically neutral aid is, is a political program for Palestinian self-determination and freedom. And the Palestinian leadership and the Palestinian people putting their weight behind that program and demanding that uh, European countries and the United States and other Western donors put their political weight behind such a program. Otherwise, aid is going to continue doing um, more harm than good, even though the Palestinians are now in a situation where they need aid to survive. So in the situation that we're in right now, why are donors ignoring the, the negative consequences of aid? I mean, surely they're not willingly helping sustain the occupation. Um, I don't know about willingly, but it's very hard to ignore the, the negative consequences of aid. There have been uh, uh, articles about it, there have been analyses about it, there was even recently a play about it. Um, they know they have offices there, they see what's happening, but um, the situation is, is, is at the moment comfortable for everyone. Or let's say it's the least uncomfortable. Um, if they, to be able to challenge the negative effects of aid, they have to decide to take Israel on politically. 
um, they have to decide, the European Union has to decide to use its uh, clout, it's, it's uh, Israel's biggest trading partner. Um, all it has to do is, is stop import of all Israeli goods until Israel abides by international law. And, you know, we would see a very huge shift in the situation. But that's very hard for them to do because Israel has very strong networks and lobbies in the European Union. Similarly, in the United States, where we're beginning to see some uh, beginnings of shift in the political establishment here, but very, very small and minor yet, you know, the U.S. would have to stop it's, it's the biggest uh, donor to Israel. It would have to stop its aid to Israel. It would have to stop pr protecting Israel at the United Nations by using its veto. Well, neither uh, uh, political party in the U.S. Is, is, is ready to do that now. They're a million miles uh, from that, although, as I say, there's some minor shifts. So th everybody's hoping that things will continue as they are and it won't blow up in their faces. But of course, where we are now, there's a big, big budget uh, 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 economic crisis, both in, in, in the European Union and in the United States. And people are beginning to ask questions, and money is beginning to dry up. And so, you know, uh, w where do you go from here? You just keep shrinking and shrinking the aid. I think, I think there will be, uh, I think the rising prices and the protests um, in the Palestinian uh, uh, occupied in the uh, Israeli occupied Palestinian territories, uh, the youth movement and the uh, uh, Arab uprisings that happened elsewhere in the Arab world, and of course, um, had their impact on on Palestinians uh, and Palestinian youth. Um, all that together is going to make the present situation untenable, and is going to force people to take some, you know, unpalatable decisions whether they want to or not. So you think that there are real prospects for this happening soon? Well, I mean, I don't see, I don't see that the present situation can continue for much longer um, with protests within, with actual calls for the resignation of uh, PA President uh, Mahmoud Abbas um, and uh, Prime Minister Salam Fayyad um, and, and continuous process against price rises. And if they can't provide the money, I mean, this situation is, is, is completely untenable. I don't say we will go to a better situation. I mean, things may get much worse, uh, unbelievable though it is after 100 years of things getting much worse, but things may still get worse before they get better. Nadia, thank you very much for being with us on Palestine Studies TV today. Thank you. Be sure to check out the latest issue of the Journal of Palestine Studies, which includes an article by Tamer Karmut and Daniel Beland on the politics of international aid to the Gaza Strip.